Okay, this is lesson 10, video lesson 10 of our semester-long uh, video sequence on basic circuit analysis. And today we are covering uh, applications of Thevenin's theorem. Thevenin's theorem. Right. So, uh, if you don't do not understand the evidence theorem, well, then you need to go back to video nine. Uh, but this is video ten, so I'm assuming that you have this within your grasp. So, uh, first of all, let's just review because we're going to need the general idea again. So, here's my circuit, and a circuit typically has an input. Okay. Actually, back up. We're not even concerned about the input. We'll say the input's even in the circuit. So I have a circuit here. Think of this as maybe your MP3 player. Uh, I have an iPod Shuffle. I'm a minimalist, and I like the iPod Shuffle. So here's my play, pause, right? Play, pause, and here's the stop. Or actually, that's volume. Play, pause is in the middle. Volume up, right? Volume down arrow to the left, arrow to the right. So this is my this is my circuit, this is my MP3 player, and it has an output, and the output is the headphone jack. And uh, the output actually has two terminals, although it's contained within the headphone jack itself. There's a positive and there's a negative. Okay, and of course this does not have to be an MP3 player. This just is a circuit with output right here. All right, and any circuit that uses dependent sources, independent sources, and resistors can be written as a very, very simple circuit like this. A voltage source, an independent voltage source, in series with a resistor. These two are equivalent so long as I find this value VTHEV correctly and this value, RTHEV correctly, they are equivalent, meaning that whatever I, whatever load resistor or whatever circuit I connect at this output terminal, or this output, right, I will get the same voltage, current, and power as if I were to connect it to this circuit. Alright, All right. so we last video we found ways of, find, of determining VTHEV and RTHEV. So, uh, RTHEV, it turns out that if I find the equivalent resistance at the output terminals, well, that's the Thevenin resistance. Okay? And if I do not connect anything, or said another way, I connect an open circuit, right? I just leave it as open, then the voltage right here, called VOC for open circuit, we showed that that open circuit voltage is the Thevenin voltage. Okay. Further, we said that if we connected a short circuit to these output terminals, and we measured or we determined the current that goes through there, let's call that ISC, for short circuit current, we know that uh, the quantities ISC, VOC, and R equivalent are all related by this. Okay, and because the open circuit voltage is the Thevenin voltage, and because the equivalent resistance at the output is the Thevenin resistance, we could alternatively write this. Okay, now, so that was the old stuff. You also know from source transformation then, well, this circuit has a transformation, and it could be written instead like this from source transformation. So that was a couple videos ago. 
So Thevenin's theorem says I can write any circuit like this thing. Okay, but because of source transformation, then it must be true I can write any circuit like this thing, where this is R Thevenin. And from source transformation, what is this current source? Well, that is V Thevenin over R Thevenin. But that's exactly, if you come back over here, the short circuit current. Right? This circuit is called the Norton equivalent circuit. Circuit. Right, where this one was the Thevenin. Thevenin equivalent circuit. Okay, so it's in this way, the short circuit current then is sometimes called IN, the Norton current. So just like the open circuit voltage is sometimes called the Thevenin voltage, the short circuit current is sometimes called the Norton current. So to summarize, any circuit, this is my black box over here, any circuit containing only dependent sources, independent sources, and resistors has a Thevenin equivalent circuit like this or equivalently a Norton equivalent circuit like this. And um, we're not going to go through any examples of finding the Norton equivalent circuit because we've already been through examples of Thevenin equivalent and source transformation. So just find the Thevenin and then transform it and you've got the Norton equivalent circuit. Okay, so moving right along. Now, the first application to these equivalent circuits is the maximum power theorem. Maximum power. So you should know, or you should have a suspicion anyway, that uh, if you're given a circuit and it's got an output, okay, think about the, the um, you know the circuitry of your wall and the, the output, you know, the the, uh, the output jack of your 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 wall. You should know that you can't just get as much power as you want. There is a limit to uh, you know what you can draw the power that you can draw from your wall outlet. There's a, if you have a battery, there is a limit to how much power that battery can provide you. Okay, so uh, we can actually figure out what that power is and it is related to the Thevenin and the Norton equivalent circuits. So, let's take a look. Let's call this VThev, right? RThev. Again, any circuit can be put into this form. And now I'm going to connect something. I'm going to connect something here. Let's call this the load resistor. Okay, this is my plugging in an appliance to the wall outlet, or um, plugging in a light bulb to the wall outlet, or uh, connecting um, a mouse to my USB output or something like that. Okay, we want to know how much power can I get from this circuit in the dash box? How much how much power can I get there? Okay, because there's going to be a limit. Maybe my mouse that I'm plugging into my USB requires uh, you know one watt of power. Well, am I going to be able to get one watt of power out? I don't know. All right, well, this is a beautiful application to uh, first semester calculus, single variable calculus. So the voltage at the load, we'll call that VL, I can get from voltage division. So this is a series circuit. So VL is equal to the Thevenin voltage times the, the resistor whose voltage I'm interested in, 
so that's RL, divided by RL plus R theV. Right? So that's the load voltage. Then there's also a load current, right? We'll call that IL. And I know since this is a series circuit, I can apply Ohm's law and the, the current traveling around in that loop is the Thevenin voltage divided by the equivalent resistance which is R Thev plus RL. Okay? So now I'm, I can figure out what the power absorbed by my load resistor is. So we'll call that P sub L. That's the power absorbed by the load. And just as always, that's the voltage times the current. So if I look at my expressions here, this is going to be V thev squared times RL over RL plus R thev squared. Now, if I've got a certain circuit, it has a deterministic Thevenin voltage and Thevenin resistance. So those two things are fixed. Okay, those are, for example, inside your wall. That's fixed. There's nothing you can do about that. But depending on how you change RL, so if you connect a, a light bulb or a washing machine or a toaster, okay, depending on how you change RL, you're going to get a different amount of power delivered to it. All right, so all of that is to say that this is a function of RL. And I'm interested in how this function changes with different values of RL. In particular, what is the maximum value um, of the power that I can get? And what resistance should I connect here to absorb that maximum power? So I'm going to actually write those questions out. How much power can I get? How much power can the circuit deliver, right? Okay. And what resistor? Or we'll say what is RL to absorb that maximum power. Okay, those are two interesting questions that we need to answer. All right, so here's my expression for the power, and I'm going to take the derivative with respect to that single variable, RL. All right, so I've got a fraction, so I need to use the, the quotient rule. Bottom times the derivative of the top. Bottom, and then the derivative of the top is just V theb squared minus the top times the derivative of the bottom. So I need to use the chain rule there. So there's a 2 comes down in front times RL plus R theb and then uh, the derivative of the inside is just 1 all over the bottom squared so we've got that denominator to the fourth now I want to know where is that derivative equal to 0 All right, and if I want a fraction to be equal to 0 then all I need is its numerator to be equal to zero. And there's no funny business going on in the denominator, i.e. dividing by zero, because uh, this denominator will never be zero because the resistances are positive. So you can't, you can't add two resistors together and get zero. So we just need the numerator to be equal to zero here. So um, I, can, I can factor out a common term. I've got V theb squared common, and I've got one uh, of these RL plus RTH, so I'll factor those out. Okay, that's what I'm factoring out. 
So in the first term, I'm left with one of these guys, RL plus RTH. Right? And then over here, I'm left with minus 2 RL equals 0. All right, well, the Thevenin voltage is not going to be 0. This is, let me back up. I have three terms here. I have this term. Let me do it in a different color. I have this term. I have this term. And I have this term. Okay, if I have the product of three things equals zero, then it must be true that one of those, at least one of those three things is zero. Okay, so now the Thevenin voltage is not going to be zero. If the Thevenin voltage is zero, that means we have a trivial circuit that does not deliver any power. So that's not right. RL plus RTheV, the second quantity here, that's not going to be zero either for the reason that we just gave about the denominator. You can't add two resistors together and get zero. So if this product is going to be zero, then this third term must be zero. So I've got RL minus 2RL and then a plus RTheV. So this is RTheV minus RL equals zero. And uh, lo and behold, this implies then that RL is equal to the Thevenin resistance. Okay, so that's actually the answer to question two. Okay, answer number two. What is RL to absorb the maximum amount of power? Well, connect whatever the Thevenin resistance of your circuit is, and you're guaranteed to absorb the maximum amount of power. That's called, well, impedance matching or resistance matching. You may, you may have heard that. It's very popular in audio, impedance matching. You have to match impedance to uh, absorb the most amount of power, right? Think about the iPod example or the MP3 example. Here's my MP3 player. Here's my, it's my shuffle, right? I like my shuffle. Okay, and it's got, it's got uh, Thevenin voltage and a Thevenin resistance. Here's my headphones. That's the load resistor. Why would I connect headphones that don't give me the maximum amount of power? That's inefficient. I don't want to do that ever. Okay, it has a volume, you know, a, a volume uh, dial or knob. Okay, to, to allow me to change the volume. So I'm going to want to be able to absorb the maximum amount of power to my headphones. So if I'm the headphone designer, I need to match my headphone resistance to that of the Thevenin circuit of the MP3 player. That's usually about 20 ohms. It's, it's almost like a standard. 20 ohms. So your headphones are probably 20 ohms. Okay, now moving on. What's the answer to problem one there? Question one. Let me delete some of this. Well, now we know that the, to absorb the maximum amount of power, the load resistor should equal the Thevenin resistance. So let me come back up here to the power expression and figure out what is the maximum amount of power. So I'm going to call this max. So now if if I substitute the Thevenin resistance in for the load resistance I'm guaranteed to have the maximum amount of power all right, let me simplify this a bit. Here I've got 2 r -thev squared, so that makes 4 r -thev squared. And one of the r -thevs cancels. And I'm left with this beautiful result. And this is the answer to question number one down there. 
how much power can the circuit deliver? Well, tell me it's Thevenin an equivalent and the maximum amount of power that the circuit can deliver is the Thevenin voltage squared divided by four times the Thevenin resistance. All right, let's look at an example. So I'm going to uh, clear this. Feel free to pause the video if you need to. All right, let's say we have a simple circuit with a 12 volt source here, 6 ohms, 12 ohms, 3 ohms, maybe a 2 amp source here. Okay, and here are the output terminals. And we're going to connect a load resistor here. And we'll, we'll draw another arrow through that to show that it's, it's a variable load resistor. And the question is, what value of RL absorbs the most power? We'll say the maximum, the maximum amount of power. Of power possible. And we'll also ask how much power? How much power is that? All right. So I need to essentially find the Thevenin equivalent circuit, okay, or the Norton equivalent circuit. So we start by removing the load. So I'm going to delete the load resistor there. And because uh, there are no dependent sources, I can quickly find the equivalent resistance here at the output terminals by turning off the two sources. So the voltage source would become a short. and the current source would become an open. Okay, so I need to find that equivalent resistance. So the 6 and the 12 are in parallel. Okay, so that's uh, 72 over 18. So that's 4. The 6 and the 12 make 4 ohms. Then that 4 ohms is in series with 3 and 2. So 4 and 3 is 7 and 2, so this is 9 ohms here. All right, 9 ohms, and that's also the Thevenin resistance. Now we have to find the Thevenin voltage. So look back up here to the original circuit okay, with the load resistor removed. We want to find the open circuit voltage. All right. Uh, this is quickly done. Notice when, when we remove the load resistor, this is not a mesh anymore. Right? Because it has no, uh, the current has no return path here. So we have two meshes, and one of the meshes, there's a current source. So this is quickly solved using mesh analysis. So we'll say here's here's two amps going this way, and here's I1. Let's use mesh analysis to solve this circuit. So if I go around mesh one, KVL around mesh one. All right, I've got six ohms times I1 plus. 12 ohms times. I1 is going with me, and 2 amps is also going with me. So I1 plus 2 amps goes through this resistor. That brings me down here, 
and I need to jump by 12 volts, so that's a minus 12 volts equals zero. Okay, so that's one equation, one unknown. So I've got six I1 and 12 I1, so that makes 18 ohms times I1. And I've got 12 ohms times two amps, that makes 24 volts. Minus 12 volts is 12 volts. Subtract it equals minus 12. Solving, I have I1 equals minus 12 volts over 18 ohms. So there is a 6 there. So this makes minus 2 over 3 amps, negative 2 thirds. All right. So looking at the original circuit, uh, I've got to find this open circuit voltage. There's no voltage drop across the 2 ohm resistor because no current can go through there because it has no return path. So VOC, this, the voltage from this node to this node, let's, let's label the nodes. Here's node, here's node 0, node 1, node 2, node 3, node 4. Okay, VOC is the, is the voltage from node 4 to node 0, but since there's no drop across the 2 ohm resistor, VOC is also the voltage from node 3 to node 0. So here's the voltage we're looking for now. This is also VOC. Alright, well if we made this ground 0 volts, that would make this 12 volts up here. Now, I1 is negative two-thirds amps, so the current is actually going through the 6 ohm resistor from node 2 to node 1. So two-thirds amps times 6 ohms is 4 volts. So there's a 4 volt drop from 2 to 1. Again, pause this video if, if you need to. There's a 4 volt drop from 2 to 1. So if 1 is at 12 volts, that means 2 is at 16 volts. Now, there's 2 amps that goes through the 3 ohm resistor and it goes from right to left, from node 3 to node 2. Two, 2 amps times 3 ohms means there's a 6 volt drop from nodes 3 to 2. So if, this, if node 2 is at 16 volts, then that means node 3 is at 22 volts. So now we have, this is 22 volts relative to down here. So that's exactly VOC. Right? So we've got VOC, which is again the Thevenin resist, uh, voltage, is 22 volts. Alright, so how much power can this thing absorb? The maximum amount of power. So actually, let's go back to the original circuit with that re load resistor connected. Right? The question was, which value of resistance should I connect here to absorb the maximum amount of power, and how much power can I get then? Well, based on what we found on the previous slide, I should connect. RL equals to R Thevenin. So if I want to absorb the maximum amount of power for this circuit, I need to connect 9 ohms. Connecting 9 ohms here absorbs the maximum amount of power. And how much power is that? Well, our previous result said take the Thevenin voltage squared divided by four times the Thevenin resistance. Okay, so do this calculation and that's your answer. That's the maximum amount of power. Any resistor other than 9 ohms gives me a value smaller than this. It's not going to absorb a lot of power. So this is my iPod, or this is my MP3 player schematic. My headphones would need to be 9 ohms resistance to get the maximum amount of power. 
if I don't adjust any volumes or anything like that, and I connect headphones less than 9 ohms or larger than 9 ohms, I'm going to get a softer audio signal, right? Lower volume. 9 ohms is the sweet spot. That's where I get the most volume delivered to my headphones. That's when my speakers are absorbing the most amount of power so they can push the most air through to my ears. All right, let's stay with this example. And I want to give you an intuitive sense of why there's a maximum anyway. Okay, because we already kind of discussed, yeah, I mean, you should be able to, uh, you, you should expect that a circuit has a maximum amount of power. But why? Okay, so let's stick with this circuit. And here's the output. Now, I, re I want to remind you that the power is I times V. Okay, so you need I, you need both current flowing and you need a voltage difference to have power. So if I were to make a plot, let's call this load power versus load resistance, right? And let's first consider two extremes, a load resistor of zero. A load resistor of zero we can achieve, that's a short circuit that has zero resistance there. So what's the voltage across a short circuit? Zero. Okay, the current could be anything, but the voltage is zero. So how much power do I have in a short circuit? Zero. So that's this point here. Now, if I start increasing that load resistance from zero then, okay, to something non-zero, then I will ha potentially have a voltage and current. So it, this graph is going to go up. Okay, I'm not going to draw it just yet, but it'll, it'll, be, uh, it'll be positive because uh, resistors always absorb power and power is positive for things absorbing. But now let's consider the other extreme, infinite, infinity resistance, infinite resistance, which we can achieve with an open circuit. Now the voltage across an open circuit could be anything, but what's the current through an open circuit? Zero. So, what, how much power do I have in an open circuit? If I have zero current, I have zero power. So over here in infinity land, I have zero power. So this thing is going to approach zero as I increase the resistance. So I have zero over here, and I have zero over here at infinity land, but I know that I have non-zero over here. So that must mean there's a maximum. And the shape of this graph looks like this. Okay, and it's right here at the sweet spot, at the Thevenin resistance. that I get the maximum amount of power. To the left, that is, resistance is less than the Thevenin resistance, I have a low, low voltage. Okay? And over here at the extreme, I have zero voltage. So I have low power. And over here to the right, of the Thevenin voltage. I've got low current. And at the extreme of infinity, I have zero current. So I have zero power. So I have low power over here. And so the Thevenin resistance is the uh, sweet spot where I have just enough voltage and I have just enough current where I get a maximum amount of power. Okay, good. So I'm going to uh, delete this. Pause it if you need to. All right, let's take a look at another example. One with dependent sources. 
So let's say I have a 9 volt battery connected to a 2 ohm resistor and we'll call the voltage across that to be Vx from left to right. Put a 1 ohm here Three VX. So there's my voltage source depends on this voltage here. Okay, here's my circuit and my output is here and here's my load resistor and same question um, what resistor should be connected. Or I said another way, um, but we'll say what will RL equal to absorb the maximum amount of power? And we'll say how much power. All right. So again, we need to find the Thevenin or the Norton equivalent circuit. All right. As this has a dependent source, we have to find the open circuit voltage and the short circuit current. So we'll start with the open circuit voltage. So I'll remove the load. So there's my open circuit. And here's the open circuit voltage. And just so I can reference these things, I'm going to label the nodes. Here's node 0. Here's node 1. Node 2. Node 3. And node 4. Okay, so the, the output is from nodes four, uh, node 4 to node 0. All right. So I only have one loop, one mesh. So let me use mesh analysis again. One equation, one unknown. Call this I1. So KVL around mesh 1. So the first thing I get to is this 2 ohm resistor. So this is 2 ohms times I1. Then I have this drop so this is a 1 ohm resistor times I1. Then I have a drop of 3Vx. So 3Vx. And what is Vx? That's the voltage across the 2 ohm resistor, which we already did. That's 2 ohms times I1. That puts me at node 0. And then I increase by 9 volts. So I move uh, minus 9 volts equals 0. All right. so. I'll combine like terms. I've got a 2, a 1, and a 6. So that makes 9 ohms times I1 equals 9 volts. Ooh, that's nice. I1 is equal to 1 amp. So there's 1 amp circling around there. Okay. You should be pretty, pretty good at that by now, mesh analysis. 1 amp circling around there. Okay, if we call the bottom node to be ground, then node 1 is at 9 volts. And if there's 1 amp circling around, then 1 amp through a 2 ohm resistor makes a 2 volt drop from left to right. So if this was at 9, this is at 7 volts. Alright, and so the voltage from node 3 to node 0 is 7. And there's no drop across the 4 ohm resistor because there's no current, because there's no return path. So the drop 3 to, to 0 is the same as the drop 4 to 0. So that's 7 volts. So here we find that VOC is equal to 7 volts, and that's the Thevenin, resist, uh, Thevenin voltage. Excuse me. That's the Thevenin voltage. All right, next. Again, because this has a dependent source, we have to get the short circuit current. So, we'll connect a short 
to our output. Here's the current I'm after. And I'm going to erase I1 and our work for I1 because I don't want you to get confused. As soon as we connect a short, things change in the circuit. Those currents change. So this work does not apply anymore. I'm going to delete that. All right, so the best strategy to find ISC would be uh, I think uh, nodal analysis. Nodal analysis. If you notice, by connecting that short, nodes 4 and 0 are the same node. Right? Because there's no component in between them anymore. So this is This is all node 0 now. So we have one, two, three, four nodes. One is ground. So that leaves three non-ground nodes. And we have two voltage sources, so that means one equation and one unknown. So if we set this to be ground like we did before, this is 9 volts. This is the only thing we need here. This is the unknown, so let's call that V3. Okay, and I'm going to guess the directions of the currents, so I'll just guess this guy's going down. Okay, I'm doing nodal analysis. I'll, go, I'll guess this guy's going to the right. Okay, so KCL at node 3. So I've got this current up here at the top left. That's coming in. So I'll write an equation for that current. That's 9 volts minus V3 over 2 ohms. Right? I have th this current coming down, leaving, and ISC leaving. So the current coming down, that's V3 minus the voltage at 2, but the voltage at 2 is 3VX. 3VX. 3, and I'm not going to write VX. VX is 9 minus V3. Okay, again, pause it if you think that that was tricky. Okay, but this is just nodal analysis now. I expect that you're able to, uh, to run through the procedure. So that's, v3, so that's the voltage at 3 minus the voltage at 2 divided by 1 ohm. That's the current going through this branch down. Then we have ISC. That's V3 minus 0 over 4 ohms. All right, so I'll multiply by the common denominator of 4 ohms. So I've got 18 volts. Actually, I've got, uh, yes, 18 volts minus 2v3 equals 4v3 minus 12 times 9v minus v3 plus v3. Okay, and we'll, we'll get the like terms to the, uh, we'll get the v3s to the right and the, com the uh, constant terms to the left. So I've got a minus 19 times, nine, minus 12 times 9, which is 108. Add that to the other side. So that makes 126 volts equals. And over here on the right, I've got 4V3 and 12V3, so that's 16, 17, 18, 19. 19 V3. So that's, that's ugly. So we'll just say V3, I'm not sure. If, there's, if 19 goes in, I don't think 19 goes into 126, but we'll just leave it like this. Okay, so that's the voltage here. I'll write it, I'll add it to the picture 126 over 19 volts. So what's ISC?
Well, we have V3 now. So ISC is the current through the 4 ohm resistor. That is 126 over 19 minus 0. Right, the voltage here minus the voltage here divided by 4 ohms. So I do know, uh, I think 4 does go into 126. So this is, uh, no, maybe it doesn't. No, not, not quite. There's a 2 there, though. 60, 63 over 38 amps. Okay, so that is ISC. So, uh, by the way, as an intermediate step, if we wanted to draw the Thevenin equivalent circuit now, we could. This would be 7 volts. And the resistor is 7 volts divided by 63 over 38. So this would be VOC divided by ISC. Okay, and if we wanted to draw the Norton equivalent circuit, it would be 63 over 38 amps, and this would be VOC divided by ISC, whatever that comes out to be. All right, but to answer the question, what will RL equal to absorb the maximum amount of power? Well, that's that Thevenin resistance. So that's, that's the VOC over ISC, right? 7 volts divided by 63 over 38 amps. So uh, I think that does not work out nicely. 38 over 9 ohms. Okay, so this is 38 over 9. 38 over 9. All right, and then how much power? Well, the maximum amount of power is, in this case, 7 volts squared divided by 4 times 38 over 9 ohms. So that comes out to be, I think, 2.90 watts. Okay, moving right along then, another application of the uh, Thevenin circuit is to model real real dependent independent sources so let me show you the, the problem that we face if we were to consider a 9 volt battery okay say we were designing a circuit and we had we had a 9 volt battery maybe it's you know powering uh, something, uh, a signal processor or something like that. Well, if we, if we modeled a real source like this, think about when I connect something, how much power can I get out of this 9-volt source? Well, I can I can arbitrarily get as much power as I want. And that's because I can arbitrarily lower the load resistor. Okay, imagine one ohm. Then the current is 9 amps. And the power is 81 watts. But now let's say I want to get more power out. And so I'll lower. Let me lower the load resistor to, let's say, 0 0.1 ohms. Now the current through there 
is 90 amps. And the power is 810 watts. You see, so if I modeled a 9 volt battery just like this, I can get as much power as I want out of that thing by lowering the load resistor. Lowering it and lowering it and lowering it, arbitrarily lowering it to get as much power as I want. But we know that that's not true. You can't do that. You can't get as much power as you want out of a 9 volt battery, right? For example. Well, inside a battery, and we're not going to be too worried about the chemistry or, or anything like that, but there's a lot of complex processes that are going on inside that battery or inside any voltage source. And Thevenin's theorem allows us to say, let's just approximate or lump all of those non-ideal things as a resistor, as an internal resistor, Ri, in series with the 9 volts. And this is how we are going to model our real voltage source. Because we know this solves the power issue because we know we cannot get as much power as we want out of this circuit. We just showed it actually. There's a maximum amount of power that you can get out of this circuit. Now you say, well what if we don't have a 9 volt source? Well, that's true. This might not be 9. Okay. In general, we call this VOC. Because the only way I can get this prescribed amount of voltage out, 9 volts for a 9 volt battery, 5 volts for USB, the only way I can get that out is if I connect an open circuit. If I have an open circuit there, I have no current flowing and no current flowing means no drop across this resistor. No drop across that resistor means the voltage here is that prescribed amount of voltage, 9 volts, 5 volts, what have you. From voltage division though, we know that as soon as I connect something, I have less than 9 volts or less than that prescribed voltage. Okay, actually, this is RL. We want to know how much voltage I can get. That voltage looks like this. Here's the load voltage versus the load resistor. If I apply zero resistance, then I get zero volts out. But as I increase, 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 that voltage goes up, and it's only at infinity when I get that 9 volts or what have you. So this is how we model a real voltage source. So how much power can I get out of a real voltage source? What's the maximum amount of power I can get out of a real voltage source? Well, tell me it's prescribed voltage and divide by four times its internal resistance. That's how much power I can get out. So for a 9 volt battery with an internal resistance of 50 ohms, which is common, the maximum amount of power I can get out is this, okay, which is about, what is that, about uh, 0.455 watts hour. No, excuse me. 0 0.405 watts of power. That's the most power I can get out of a 9-volt battery 
with a 50 ohm resistance. Okay, if I had, if I wanted to model a real current source, the model would not be this. Because there's an issue here, the same issue. If I connect something, load resistor, the power that I can get out of my source can be made arbitrarily high, right? Just like I could get as much uh, power as I wanted over here with the voltage source, I can get as much power from here. All I have to do is make this RL keep increasing it. For example, if I had a one amp source and I made this one kilo ohm, the voltage across would be one kilovolts and the power would be one amp times one kilovolts would be one kilowatt of power. So if I wanted more power, I just increase RL. For example, maybe make it 10 kilo ohms. Now the voltage across is 10 kilovolts, and the power through uh, the power absorbed is 10 kilowatts. All right. So we know that we know that a current source you can't just draw as much power as you want. So this is not a good model for a real current source. Instead, Norton's theorem says, let's model that current source, one amp, or whatever it was, we'll call that IN, or um, let's call it ISC. In parallel with an internal resistance. Okay, so here's the dash box. And this is internal resistance RI. Here's our real current source. And so when I connect something, okay, there's going to be a maximum amount of power that I can draw from that real current source. And this prescribed value is called ISC, again, because the only way I can get all of that current, one amp, for example, is if I connect a short here. If I connect a short, then all of that current is going to go through the short, through the output, right? None of it's going to get lost in the internal. And that's something that I, I do want to emphasize here. This is internal to the source. If you like voltage sources better, this is internal to the battery. We do not have access to this node. No access to that node. That is, we cannot separate the ideal voltage source from the internal resistance. Likewise, we have no access to this loop. No access to that loop. We cannot separate an ideal current source from the internal resistance. This is how we model a real current source.